Councillor Banks, you are all set. Okay, thank you so much and good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's public safety meeting. Today's date is October 6th and the hour is 6.30. So I'd like to welcome everyone tonight for attending. I am going to recognize all of you beautiful faces around this virtual screen. I'd like to um, acknowledge our mayor, Sherry Cantor, Deputy Mayor Leon Davidoff, uh, Councillor Chris Williams, let's see who else, Councillor Lee Gold, um, Battalion Chief, Assistant Chief Mike Sinascali, uh, Assistant Chief Lawrence T um, Tara. Um, I see the officers to the right of my screen, Pete Casella, and I see his team behind him, and Chief Riddick. Uh, let's see who else. I see Mrs. Helen Rubino Turco, Office of Corporation Counsel Cynthia Latour, uh, and Mrs. Astrid Calderon, and uh, Forgive me, Afafiades. It's uh, Lieutenant Vafiades with the police department. Sorry, I'm not sure why my name's displaying uh, displaying okay. like that with my first initial and last name. It is it, it is a little confusing. I'll look into change that. Welcome, and I think I have everybody. Oh, uh, Cat, um, Chief Priest, and his team as well. Okay, and I know. Uh, Mr. Hart is going to be joining us a little later uh, into the meeting. So I want to call the meeting to order. And um, you know what? Before I get into the approval of, of the minutes, I do want to acknowledge uh, that we are still in the midst of this pandemic. And I do want to just take some time to acknowledge uh, many of our residents that are still suffering from this um, virus. Um, whether or not they have been vaccinated, uh, whether or not they've been uh, tested. But I do just want to keep that in the front of us that this uh, virus is still very much alive and in front of us. And our first and foremost is to keep our residents and businesses safe. So just thank you for all the work that you continue to do. And I recognize that you all are doing the heavy lifting right now. All right, so the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from 9 1 uh, 2021. I hope everybody had a chance to review the minutes and if there were any um, edits or corrections that need to be made, please let me know. I know I didn't see any when I reviewed them. And if there aren't any, then I would like to motion to approve the minutes and let that be reflected in the record. So moved. And a second. Thank you, Chris. All right, thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is the radiologic emergency preparedness um, host community. And um, I'm going to look to Chief Priest to start us off on that report and discussion. Well, thank you, Chairman Moon Blanks. It's nice to see you all. I'm going to take off my mask so that you can hear me a little bit. My colleagues are all masked up and we have some nice fresh air going in here. Thank you. So um, uh, tonight uh, I have a, attached a written summary. It's a one pager. I'm going to spend uh, the next just couple minutes to laying out our path and uh, hearing any thoughts that the public safety committee or the members present tonight may have for us. And if uh, need be, we can certainly research this more and uh, come back to the committee next month if there were additional questions that we couldn't answer tonight. So, um, in essence, we were approached by the Department of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, sometimes called DEMIS, and we were asked to participate in the state's radiological emergency response plan as a host community. So, uh, when serving as a host community, the obligation of the town would be to identify and plan for setting up a community reception center. Um, which is uh, in the event of an emergency down there, which would be warranting evacuations of the communities that directly surround the Millstone power plant. So the function of a host community or a community reception center is what it's called, um, is to run a defined process to intake people who are evacuating, 
to assess them for their needs, but then to gateway them into a sheltering or a longer term assistance uh, process. So, um, what a, what a community reception center does is, is we were then plan to take them in, but really it only is accounting for a, a percentage of the evacuating community. And it's really only in place for about 12 to 24 hours. And the longer term sheltering needs would then be handled through a sheltering organization, such as the American Red Cross. And that sheltering wouldn't necessarily take uh, place within the town of West Hartford. So we, we've spent a lot of time with this and, and discussing it as a team and uh, we're in the process of doing our due diligence and, you know, finding out if we can uh, or just sidestep or refuse the state's request. But obviously uh, we're talking about it tonight. So uh, you can see the trajectory that uh, we're on. Um, and, and certainly once we launch the term radiological, um, we understand that people's ears perk up. You know, so it makes sense for me to jump directly into directly into uh, the risk and more pointedly, you know, perhaps the perception of risk to the community that we're even engaging in this discussion. So I would start by saying that risk is often looked at in terms of probability and severity and um, the nuclear facilities. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the probability of a nuclear emergency itself is so very low and, and we've had some discussions with um, the state about this. And what they've advised us is, is that they have numerous redundancies in uh, their technology and security that really are expected to prevent or avert a radiological emergency before it even happens. So it's very um, low that something would extend outside of the borders of the, uh, the their plant itself. So. You know, per the state, um, their, their goal, as well as the plant operators, is to um, evacuate the public before any potential exposure to radiation for those those people um, down in the area. So, I guess what we would say is, is really the probability of evacuations is quite low to start with, um, but it is even lower um, that there would be some sort of radiological release um, that is then paired with um, an evacuation. So, you know, talking a little bit about severity, I don't think we really should look at this as though it's a community lens. It's really an overall state issue if there was a problem down at Millstone. And the reality is that any type of evacuation or evacuation with contamination, no matter how remote that be, um, it, it would be incredibly serious, but not for uh, just West Hartford, but really it's a state type of issue. So. In the unlikely event that it did happen, you know, multiple community reception centers are spun up across the state of Connecticut to assess and then, if necessary, decontaminate and uh, our evacuees. So, so this is a really big and important point, which is, is you know, an evacuee who has been exposed to radiation um, does not make them radioactive. Um, in the in the unlikely event they would have some type of particulate on them, uh, the decontamination process is done um, with specialized metering equipment. Um, we will be following common industry standard practices that we already have training in for um, other hazards. And the issue of contamination is then resolved through containment um, or another type of vetted process. So, in essence, agreeing to be a host community is not necessarily going to make West Hartford a radioactive if there was an emergency. So, you know, there's a lot of variables when a radiological emergency happens, you know, very hard to quantify the severity of the incident. Uh, but the overall assessment that we've we've arrived at is, is that combining both the probability and severity is that there's a low risk for participating as a host community. Um, I would also note, you know, the risk of a nuclear emergency is actually present Right at the moment, as we sit here today, uh, we don't have intensive or uh, specific training for it. Uh, but if it happened now, um, our, our estimation is, is that folks would be leaving the area, potentially coming here anyways. So no matter what level of risk we ultimately assign to this, we know the best way to reduce our risk is through to mitigate it through planning and preparedness. So at this point, you know, you know, perhaps we were asking, well, why don't we just step this step sidestep this? Why are we even involved in this? Uh, it's low risk. It's unlikely to happen. Um, but if it does, it's going to affect everyone, some physically, but likely all of us emotionally. And we can't insulate ourselves or be the proverbial ostrich in the sand um, for something like this. So if an emergency occurred, common sense and actually some of the state planning is telling us that we are on the northern corridor out of that particular area. Uh, the route 2 corridor and people are likely to head to our community anyways. 
And this is a big part of why the state is actually consulting us and asking us to take on this, uh, this responsibility. So in, in our overall evaluation, we would rather have the training, the equipment, a location that is identified and having a plan in place. Uh, the state and others will help us with that plan, with training, and they will financially support all of the costs of preparing for and running a community reception center, um, as well as some aspects to our emergency operations center. And uh, I would really highlight too that any of the related training or exercise costs are fully reimbursable by the state. And at this point, we have tremendous support from the state and other host communities, and we've gone about the process of asking questions and considering this, and they have definitely indicated their vested interest in uh, our success and, again, in supporting uh, any cost to our community. So at, at this point, we, we kind of arrived at a neutral conclusion of it, it could be beneficial to us. It's, there's, there's some things that come with it, but Here's the real reason why it is that we're bringing this to the public safety committee and why we've discussed this as a community is. We believe the community reception center and the planning, the preparedness, the training, the equipment, the location. It's very similar to the same type of setup. Should we need a family assistance center for a critical incident or for some type of a shelter setup? You know, another way of saying that is, is that anything that we're doing relative to host community. Um, it's immediately translatable to other functions where we believe that there's probably a higher probability to need one of those type of uh, facilities set up. So we also believe that these translatable functions are going to be paired with both sustained and sustainable funding that would come to the state. <clears throat> so um, emergency management uh, has been a little behind the scenes in West Hartford. We're certainly growing. Uh, the pandemic has highlighted this, the addition of Bob McHugh's position. Um, we're really proving daily that our planning is critical, but it's going to pay dividends for us in terms of our coordination and preparedness for emergencies. So we have elevated our, our capabilities right now. We're going to continue to elevate them, and we see this as the next phase, uh, which will build even stronger relationships with the state and also with the federal government around preparedness. So you've heard me talk a lot about uh, uniformed personnel, <clears throat> and uh, I would be certainly remiss not to highlight our reinvigorated uh, CERT program. A recent article was published in weha.com, and uh, we really believe um, that this program can positively impact, uh, the CERT program can proceed us, can move forward, that we can uh, assist us with the host community program. So. I'd like to recognize the work that Bob has done. Certainly he hates it when I do this to him publicly, but the reality is, is everybody knows um, exactly how much work. And actually I'm gonna have um, Owen Kutcher um, lean his head in here. Owen is uh, an intern that started with us. Hope you had around Owen, <laughs> wave and say hello. There, there you go. <laughs> so it, this, is a, this is a great um, asset to us. Um, Owen is one of the charter members of our CERT team. He's been doing some work with us. Um, and he's one of 35 dedicated CERT individuals who recently completed their training. So the host community is a good example of where our trained uniformed emergency responders can appropriately be supplemented with CERT team members who can assist us with the administration, planning, and logistical support for a community reception center. And in essence, I, I believe that this program will help us be more prepared as a community and will continue to improve our emergency management program. So our next steps, uh, this is part of our finalizing our due diligence. Uh, we've spoken with some of our key town staff or stakeholders and they've reviewed it for a proof of concept. We have a couple more stops with some of our staff members before entering into an MOU with the state to agree to serve in this capacity. Um, if we were, if we move forward with this, certainly there's some logistical time and effort uh, that would go into this, noting, of course, that those costs would be reimbursable. Our obligation afterwards would be to conduct one drill every seven years, and the first one from about a year to the uh, a year from when we first agree to serve in this capacity. So um, with that, that kind of concludes uh, my pitch here. Um, I would be interested in hearing any of your thoughts, questions, or concerns. And uh, again, I would just say, if I can't answer it for you tonight, uh, we can certainly come back uh, with more information or bring uh, additional members of the state to help uh, fill out this picture. So thank you, Chairman Blanks. I'll turn it back to you for any questions. 
Thank you, Chief Priest. Um, that was a great presentation. And in terms of reading the material, I did find it very interesting and fascinating as well, just kind of picturing if we were ever to come to that, and hopefully that never happened, just how that would all unfold. So thank you for providing that background information. Um, I'll turn over to my colleagues. Does anybody have any questions for Chief Priest or his team? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Blanks. Uh, thanks, Chief Priest, for a very comprehensive uh, overview of the memo that you sent. Uh, I would concur that uh, our, our our emergency management team uh, strives uh, to be uh, well trained, uh, to be knowledgeable about risk, and uh, is uh, always ready to uh, respond. So, if you think after a further uh, study and investigation in this matter that uh, we're going to be able to have the appropriate resources necessary uh, to be deployed in case of uh, this unlikely emergency, but one never knows what can happen, then. I would uh, basically, um, you know, follow your lead in, in recommendation, sir. Um, I, I think you have the expertise here, and you you have uh, demonstrated that uh, you would only uh, take on a responsibility that you thought would be in the best interest uh, of our community and uh, would serve the public safety of not only our residents but the residents of the region and the state as well. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there any other questions? All right, um, I don't have any other, I don't have a question. I guess as I was reading through it, um, and as you were providing your presentation, if there ever was um, this type of emergency and we have all the training um, that the state would provide to us, uh, Chief, and I know that we have a plan, um, so this is more for um, informational for residents. Um, how would we, you know, address the emergency in terms of setting up the CRC, but still maintain our services to our town residents if it were ever to come to this? So that that's an excellent question. Uh, Ms. Blanks. So the, the way we would look at this is, is, you know, first of all, we believe that the state's plan is to start to evacuate people who have not been exposed to radiation first. So this would become more of a sheltering operation first. And with the assistance of the CERT team, we believe that we would be able to handle those responsibilities. But as more, if there were additional incidents that were occurring in town, we always ensure that we have the right resources whether our own or whether through mutual aid to ensure that we're sending an appropriate emergency response. Um, I would just note that, you know, if something of this magnitude were to occur, the entire state is going to be mobilized in some capacity. We have such things as the statewide fire rescue uh, plan that mobilizes other resources in the town. So um, what I would say is, is I would accept that as my personal responsibility and our operations to division to make sure that we're providing those services to the residents while at the same time, you know, serving a very needed role as part of the state's uh, radiological emergency response plan. So ho hopefully that answers your question. I just looked at any the of my state, colleagues if I missed the, anything. The state would also be sending resources. So it's not just us. Correct. And actually, you know, uh, Councilor, that, that is a really excellent point, which is, is um, the host community program is something that we would participate in, but at the time that a community uh, reception center is activated, numerous resources from other both state and federal agencies are deployed, would be deployed into town to help manage that. So it's not like West Hartford would be, um, you know, responsible for all of the things that occur there. We, we have the location and some of the tasks, but that's an excellent question. And I really appreciate you asking that. Thank you for that response. Uh, Chief, so if there aren't any other questions, I'll move to the next agenda item. But before I do so, um, I do want to acknowledge that Councillor Faye has joined us, and I do realize that I missed someone when I was going around um, the screen, and that is Miss Samantha. Is it in this? So I'd like to welcome you um, to this meeting. And um, so for me, I, I don't want to make an assumption, so I'll just let you sort of introduce yourself. And then I do want to acknowledge that town manager Hart has joined us as well. Uh, 
Hi, I'm the um, new social worker for the social services department. Thank you and welcome. And I thought that's who you were, but again, I didn't want to make an assumption. So thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Thank, thank you for you. having me. All right. So we will, and I did acknowledge you, Counselor Faye, right? You did. Thank you very much. All right. All right. So I'd like to move to the next um, agenda item, which is the Connecticut Institute for Youth and Police Relations. And I'm going to turn it over to either Chief Riddick or Mr. Hart. I don't know who would like to go first. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Matt Hart, Town Manager. Good to see everyone online this evening. I believe the Chief is going to kick this item off and has some other folks um, at the meeting tonight who will help present this item. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, Vern Riddick, Police Chief. You know, under the direction and tutelage of uh, the town manager and the mayor, uh, since the time that I've been here, we've been looking for opportunities to expand our footprint into the community uh, through interactions and just breaking down barriers. So this program uh, run from New out of New Haven, uh, University of New Haven, and in conjunction with uh, private funding, it was a great opportunity. So at this time, we'll have Lieutenant Vafiatis uh, give a brief description and then kick it off. Uh, to his team for a very quick presentation of about 10 minutes or so, if you can indulge us. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that these officers have done. Um, it, it's, it's really good, and I really hope that we can kick this off and continue and sustain it going forward. Uh, partial funding for this will come through the pass-through uh, from the, uh, the government funding with the COVID funding. So, that being said, uh, Lieutenant Vafiatis. Thank you, Chief, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I won't take up too much time. I'll let the officers uh, explain the, the good work that they did. This was an opportunity that was that was brought to us to enroll some officers in uh, the first ever program put on by the Connecticut Institute of Youth Police Relations through the University of New Haven. It took place in Hartford, and uh, I assigned the, or we as a department assigned our SROs and our officers that are in the schools and, and working with kids to this program. So I'll uh, I'll turn it over to Officer Hopkins, who is the SRO of Connard, Officer Sanford, who is the SRO at Hall High School, and Officer Casella, who handles Sedgwick as well as a few of the elementary schools. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you. All for having us. I'm um, Officer Joe Hopkins. I'm the SRO over at Conard High School. Um, so, like the lieutenant just uh, said, we had the opportunity to take part in the pilot program for the Connecticut Institute for Youth and Police Relations. Uh, it was put on by the Tau Youth Justice Institute. Uh, we're going to be sharing the screen here um, for you guys to see the PowerPoint that we had put together. Um, we had the opportunity to work with some really great professors. Um, the vice president of the university, uh, Dr. Lorenzo Boyd, uh, headed the program with Dr. Danielle Cooper. Uh, the mission statement here that you guys see, uh, the Connecticut Institute for Youth and Police Relations is designed to enhance education and train uh, training delivered to police officers to assist them in balancing demands of public safety and the best interest of youth in the black and diverse communities. So exactly what this says here, we had the opportunity to work with several different psychologists within the uh, within the university who came in. This has been a year long program for us that we're still actually in uh, now. Um, we had the opportunity to start it last February uh, and they kind of helped to build us up um, with kind of learning about the uh, diverse communities and then kind of delving into our own communities in the way that we can kind of reach out to um, the youth that we uh, interact with every day at our level. Um, we had the opportunity to speak with different youth panels uh, as well as adult panels to kind of see uh, what they thought about uh, police in their schools, in their communities, uh, how much outreach is done with uh, within the community and different ways that we can uh, kind of help bridge that gap. Uh, we had the opportunity to, like I said, work with these different psychologists and kind of go over the statistics and the breakdown of the youth and um, 
you know, their brain development, what they're thinking of, you know, the risks versus the rewards of, you know, their actions and, um, you know, how we can better relate to them so that they understand us and we can understand them as well. Um, in doing so, we had the opportunity to uh, partner with the Hannock Center within the town. Um, so I'm going to have a couple of the other officers explain that. So the Hannock Center um, was our community partner that we chose. And for, for you guys that don't have never heard of the Hannock Center, it's an out, it's a, uh, it's a neighborhood, the, the neighborhood uh, outreach center. And they, uh, it's a collaboration really between social services, the housing authority, uh, our West Hartford public school system. And um, they, uh, they, they provide uh, and help families uh, with limited economic means. Um, they help them become uh, more financially uh, independent, and they also help them uh, integrate into the community uh, by offer, offering a lot of different resources. Uh, it really, their, their, their primary goal is to, of, of the center, is to provide opportunities to help their quality of life. Um, some of those things, some of the things that, 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 it, that the programs that are included are a food share distribution and uh, middle school and, and elementary school play uh, groups, Camp Hillcrest over the summer, educational field trips, and a food pantry. And there's a lot of different stuff. Um, the Hannock Center started back in 97, and it, was really, it really started because the social workers and the psychologists at the elementary schools were concerned that families and the kids from from this area, from the Hillcrest area, weren't getting what they needed at home. So that's kind of why this why this whole this uh, Hannock Center, uh, you know, kind of grew. And um, when I approached uh, Susan Oslander, who who's the, um, the community partnership manager for the town, and she works with the Hannock Center, she was thrilled that we asked to partner with her. Um, it's it's it was something that we that she thought would be a, a, an excellent idea. She was you know, on board from day one, and I think it's going to be um, it's going to be a great program. Um, one of the main things that Susan did say that really stuck with my, me and my colleagues, uh, she said, you know, if you want to start, if you want to change the life of a child, to start with their family. And I think that was that's kind of their primary goal as a hand as the Hannock Center, and that's something that uh, we're going to keep in the back of our minds as we start to do this program. So I'm going to hand it over to Officer Sanford, and he's going to explain a little bit more about our program. Good evening, Officer Nick Sanford of Hall High School SRO, uh, born and raised in West Hartford. So this is, is an awesome opportunity to get involved in a program that we can pilot here and become uh, something that takes place over the you know the next several years. Um, being a part of the CIYPR kind of really created an idea of why we need to have police engagement with youth. Um, you know, the town's diversity, it's really starting to become multicultural. Um, opportunity for partnership in neighboring communities. Um, a lot of the other officers in our program, Hartford, uh, Windsor, East Hartford, these are officers that we're going to be working with over the next couple of years and hopefully create a multi jurisdictional program for multiple different kids to meet other kids from other communities and get involved with them. Obviously, you know, with, with the current events with police in the United States, um, the fear and mistrust of police, and then our main goal is to, you know, humanize the badge and create a, you know, who is that officer behind his uniform? So kind of what we came up with, this is a, a breakdown of the six week program that we're, we're going to start with, and then it's obviously going to evolve from there. So every Wednesday, since the schools get out early, uh, we plan on going down to the Hannock Center and from around 1 30 to uh, 3 30. We're going to have a, a 2 hour long event with about 15 students at the start. They're going to range from grades 3 to 8. And then obviously myself and my other 2 colleagues here will be joined by other officers who we've already seen interested. Of, of getting involved um, and we have a bunch of different top uh, topics that are going to start um, and I'll show you on the next slide. Um, and it's going to run from hopefully the 
beginning of November. Oh, it's moving to January. I'm sorry, January 5th uh, through February 9th. So week one, we're going to start up with a, you know, an icebreaker police engagement introduction, get kids involved, uh, come together as a group and, and do a lot of group group activities. And then we, as you can see here, we have a bunch of different other topics that we're going to talk with. These are some of the things that we've been seeing in the schools that are really uh, after COVID uh, with the schools closing, a lot of the issues that we're seeing with kids and, you know, dealing with peer pressure, you know, substance abuse rising here in the schools with vaping and some of the other um, marijuana stuff. Um, and then we wanted to also incorporate something in there is what can we do for our community? So this is a opportunity that we'll turn over to the actual kids in our group and say, come up with an idea of what can they do for their community? What can they do for the Hillcrest community? Hopefully that can be either you know some type of uh, landscaping, gardening, something along those lines to help better better the Hillcrest community. And then, you know, finishing up with character building, social gathering for parents and students. It goes back to, you know, the kids being involved along with their parents. Um, you know, and then and then the graduation as well. Yeah, we do have a next one. And just uh, to to end with some of our goals, um, sustainability. That's a huge. That's a huge one. We really want to be able to run this program um, several times a year. You know, we're going to start it in January. We're going to see how it goes, um, and you know, we're going to try to get feedback from the kids and their parents and people that work at the Hannock Center to see what we can do better. So maybe we can run it again in the spring and, and summer. And just and again, the, the sustainability is one of, is going to be one of our biggest uh, goals with this. Uh, we're going to focus on those life skills, maybe that stuff at home uh, that they're not getting, the stuff that's missing. Okay, communication, respect, compassion. We're going to really harp on some of those things and and um, really help help these kids and and you know be the best role models we can for them. Um, and then just being able to network with uh, with other communities um, uh, to collaborate. So you know the, that class had fourteen other um, individuals, uh, officers, and, and that work with youth throughout the state. And, uh, you know, if our program starts to kick off in theirs and we can maybe start to do collaborations with uh, neighboring communities. And um, so there's the sky's the limit when it comes to uh, working with even other cities and, and towns with this stuff. Okay. And then just uh, kind of touching base on what Nick had mentioned, you know, the idea for this is we worked with a bunch of different jurisdictions throughout this class and we're still working with them. And the idea is to network with them in the future. Um, so getting feedback from our kids, uh, getting feedback from the parents, getting feedback from the Hannock Center on things that we can do to improve the program is gonna be huge. And then, uh, you know, I, I grabbed this quote from a documentary that we watched within the class. Kids who do not get attention at home will seek it from somewhere else. And that's kind of where we come in, right? We're coming in here, we wanna show them that, you know, we're here to, uh, you know, we're here for them. We're he here as, you know, we're a guest in their community, right? We're there to make a difference for them and for them to see us as human beings. Um, you know, and that's again why we want to have uh, you know, other officers come down so they can meet just beyond me, Nick, and Pete. Uh, we want to end every single session with a 10 to 15 minute demonstration of a specialized division. We've gotten a lot of interest from other divisions uh who would like to come down and have a chance to speak with these kids and you know help make a difference in their life because we want to see them succeed. We want them positively reinforced. Everything that happens, you know, it's all about that restorative learning and that restorative justice. So that's uh, kind of what our program is, um, you know, throughout this class. Uh, it was an awesome experience. Uh, it's still going, like I said, we have the opportunity to touch base with them whenever they've really been an outlet for us, you know, anytime we've, anytime we've needed them. Uh, and it's been it's been awesome. It's been a, a different experience. It's a different type of training, but you know, just having the support from those professors, from those doctors, those psychologists, having each other, having other officers kind of going through it. And we had people from you know 19 years on the job to I think our youngest one was two and a half years on. So a wide variety, a lot of different backgrounds, um, you know, all bright, uh, all being brought together to you know. With one end goal of making a difference in the youth and you know being there for them. So, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, if you guys have any questions, obviously we'll take the questions. 
Uh, thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I mean, uh, uh, I do have some questions, but I just really want to say it was an awesome presentation. Um, just to listen to hear you all talk about the training you received and what you came back with and how you're implementing it. I mean, just great and wonderful job. Um, I don't know, Chief, if you wanted to add anything or town manager, if you wanted to add anything before I go to questions, but I do have a question and even a, another comment for the three of you. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Anybody with questions or? Councilor Williams or, or Mayor, I don't know. Mayor and then Councilor Williams. Actually go to the committee members first and then I'll go, thanks. Okay. Councilor Williams, you have it. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, just briefly, wonderful presentation. Thank you, officers. Um, I think this is a, obviously a very important project, and you know, given what's gone on in the last year or so, um, I know it's been very hard at times to be a police officer, and I think this sort of interfacing with the youth is really important. And uh, you represent the town so well. Um, and uh, we all appreciate it very much. So thank you for your work on this and for your presentation tonight. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, Deputy Mayor and then Mayor, you okay with that? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Blanks. Um, I, I, I too think that uh, the steps that you've taken uh, with this program will pay dividends that we can't even imagine uh, as of tonight. And uh, it's so important to be present in the lives of those who are struggling. And one just has to look at today's Hartford Current uh, article uh, talking about uh, uh, mental health issues with so many children uh, being admitted to uh, Connecticut Children's uh, throughout this pandemic. The struggle is real. And um, it, it affects everyone in our community, and there it knows no uh, differentiation based on any type of, uh, of factors. Uh, it can be wealthy families, uh, poor families, uh, families of all different ethnicities, and uh, all across our town and across our region. So um, I, I think uh, first uh, first step is we acknowledge that uh, it's necessary uh, to do this outreach. Uh, we're taking the necessary steps to do that. So thank you for for participating and all those uh, who are so engaged. And I think in the long run, when we stop to evaluate uh, this program and programs like this, uh, we will once again be recognized as a community leader uh, because we took these steps on the front end instead of doing things uh, after something. Uh, not so good happened. So thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Mayor Cantor. Thank you so much. I am I'm ready to cry, seriously. I just this is this is the best of who you are. Um, I mean, you do so many good things, and I'm uh, talking to the officers and uh, Lieutenant Buffiatis, um, and obviously the uh, leadership team. Um, it is so uh it, it really just um, moves me in such a big way how committed you are to this. I can hear it in your presentation and your voices and the thought you've given to it. So uh, this will change lives um, in a positive way. Uh, there's no doubt. Um, and I even text the town manager. I said, I think it's a recruitment tool as well for future um, for future leaders, uh, future officers and and uh, and other law enforcement leaders uh, that will have uh, you know that you're go you're going to uh, you're going to be influencing by you your by your uh, commitment uh, and your and your caring and your and and being there for them so um, Hanukkah has been a real success story uh, and 
the cooperation between social services uh, and between uh, the um, edu you know, the, our public uh, West Harvard public schools um, and obviously uh, law enforcement. This is a win win and I'm just so grateful uh, for all of your efforts and I applaud you uh, and I'm really excited to hear more. And I also uh, did send a little text to the town manager. I'd love to have you present for the um, mayor's youth council. This is a group of uh, of youth that are volunteering to advise us, but I also think that you know maybe you'll get some input to them on on how helpful this would have been. This is a very diverse group of, of students, and uh, and might be helpful for both for you know to, for you to engage. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Deputy Mayor, as well. Thank you, Mayor. Anybody else? So, um, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair, Matt Hart, Town Manager. I'd also like to thank our, our school resource officers and uh, Lieutenant Vafiatis and Chief Riddick for their leadership and their great work on, it, on this initiative. Looking forward to hearing more uh, about your progress as you move forward. I think in addition to the mayor's comments, this is something that our business community could get very excited about and would, uh, would wish to sponsor and support as well. So kudos to you for taking this on and uh, look, looking forward to, to hearing good news as you move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hart. So what I would like to say, oh God, I loved your uh, presentation and I loved your out of the box thinking. Um, so I have three girls and my two youngest girls, they really identified with the school resource officer. So I know many of the high school students, teenagers, they identify with you all. And for you to think out of the box and collaborate with Hannock and those students, and not only that, but to collaborate with the families, thought that is huge. And along with, you know, your, um, your training and along with what you put together, the program that you put together and how now you're gonna make it a fun activity by looking at how to beautify where they live in that neighborhood you know, that speaks volumes well after their youthhood, because now you're gonna teach them some skill sets and what they can do with their hand and how you're just gonna change the footprint for them when they get up in the morning and when they come back home. And also the things that you're gonna to introduce to them during the day on that Wednesday after school. So I just really applaud um, what you all are doing and how you're also connecting with the other officers who went through the training with you, because why uh, reinvent the wheel when you can borrow some of the things that others are doing and that are very successful? So when I read the information and I was looking at when the training was conducted, I'm glad you cleared it up for me because I was gonna ask, I thought it was coming, but it sounds like you've already, the February 12th through September 10th had occurred in 20, was it 2020, 2021? 2021 is when you went through it. Okay, then the other question that I had for you was, um, what were, and you talked about this in the presentation, but I really wanted to know what were some key takeaways that you learned that perhaps you didn't know before the training? I'm just curious to hear um, from each of you. Uh, for me, uh, a lot of what I took from the program was actually learning from the psychologists and kind of looking at it from, you know, the idea of the human development side of it. You know, when does the human brain actually develop? You know, things that you don't really think about the risks uh, versus ramifications of, you know, what juveniles or, you know, the young adults of our community are thinking about. Um, the example given to us by one of the psychologists, kind of, you know, a fun one, but it's like, you know, a 14 year old goes on a roller coaster, goes skydiving and just thinks, oh, my gosh, this is fun. This is great. Whereas a 30 year old who lived and, uh, you know, has seen more life experiences might be like, uh, if I go on this thing and the thing malfunctions, I'm going down and there's nothing good about that. So obviously we're looking at it from a different side on a law enforcement side, but I would say for me personally, it was the, uh, the brain development aspect of, you know, the brain fully develops at the age of 25. Well, you know, so 
do that are they really grasping what's going on at such a young age you know that's a topic of discussion that you know we had you know month and month again you know with different psychologists learning about different statistics so for me it was the brain development side of it um for myself i think when when we did have youth panels come in uh to talk to us about their views on police officers, and especially over the last couple of years, uh, one of a lot of the feedback that we got from the youth was uh, that there's a fear. There's a fear of police. There's a fear and mistrust of us. And I think that's we're going to keep that in the back of our head. And definitely that was a driving force in in, in making this program and developing this program because we really want to humanize. I know we said it in the presentation. But we really want to humanize. We want to show them that we're dads and brothers and coaches, and that we're not separate from the community but but we're together right we're, we're, we're part of the community and i think that's one of the main things that we really want to do when we're when we're reaching uh, when we're trying to reach reach out to these kids uh the, the, i think the biggest thing for me was i i mean this program really kind of broke down our walls as law enforcement you know we see a lot of things from the law law enforcement perspective but then when we started hearing, you know, a lot of these panels and the stories from a lot of these kids from inner city Hartford and and, and Waterbury and New Haven, um, it really broke those walls down and it made us think, like, you know, put ourselves in, in those kids' shoes in those in those situations and how that interaction with that police officer has changed their perspective on police, regardless of who the officer is, who they who they're dealing with. Um, that was very eye opening for us because early on in the program, we wanted to be like, well, you know, this is probably why that officer handled it that way. Whereas instead of making an excuse for that officer, we see it from the other side and try to, you know, find other ways to, you know, handle it and deal with it. So I think that was the biggest thing that kind of reminisced with all of us over the course of the last eight, eight or nine months that we've been in the program. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I love that um, statement, humanize, humanize the badge. Um, that's real talk. And just again, thank you for the presentation. It was awesome. Okay. If we don't have any other questions or comments, uh, we can move to the next agenda item, which is ordinance amending the vehicles prohibited from public streets. Um, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair, Matt Hart, town manager. I'll lead off and then through you as Chief Riddick, if he has any additional comments. And then uh, we have our assistant corporation counsel, Cynthia Latour with us this evening as well to assist with questions. And I'd like to thank attorney Latour for you know, doing the bulk of the work to prepare the draft here in consultation with Chief Riddick. So the reason why we're introducing this to the committee, you know, at, as you know, West Hartford and other towns around the capital region, you know, we, we have been dealing over the last couple of months with these, uh, we believe they're, they're organized, um, organized rides, probably organized via social media, uh, ATVs and uh, other vehicles that aren't street legal, you know, riding with, with some impunity uh, through our community and in neighboring communities as well. And we feel as though an ordinance along these lines would be just an additional tool in our police officers toolkit. So if committee members have access to, uh, to the ordinance posted online, if you're working off of a computer or a tablet, what have you, I'd ask you to pull it up and I'll just speak to it and uh, I'll add a, a little bit of uh, detail here. So as you'll see, and this is typical with any ordinance we prepare, we have a few whereas clause uh, clauses up front that really provide, that state the public purpose and the reason why um, the ordinance would be, uh, would be codified. And again, just citing that we've seen an increase in the number of folks operating all-terrain vehicles, ATVs in our town, 
Uh, we've got concerns about noise, uh, more importantly, the safety and well being of pedestrians, passers by, and the operators themselves. And that the reckless operation of these vehicles certainly poses a risk for, uh, for the riders, pedestrians, and the community at large. Uh, moving down through the document, we've got a good definition of a motorized scooter as well as a pocket motorcycle. Um, you could look at those in, uh, you, you can read the definitions yourself, so I'm, I'm not going to do that now. We did utilize the statutory definition of an ATV for purposes of the ordinance. Uh, moving on to the second page, here's where we get at the restrictions. You'll see uh, up, up on the top here that no one can operate a motorized scooter or a pocket motorcycle on our public streets, on our public streets, either on the street or within, within the street limits. And uh, very, very importantly, in addition to the police having the ability to issue a citation under this subsection C here, they would have the ability to impound, impound one of these vehicles and to hold it until they can turn it over to a responsible adult. You know, that would be a very, very important tool for us to have to be able to temporarily impound these vehicles uh, so that we can uh, we can speak with a, a responsible person, whether it's a custodial parent, uh, what have you. Uh, the next the next section deals with ATVs more specifically. It prohibits the use of uh, of ATVs on our public streets, but also takes it to apply apply the prohibition to our sidewalks, parks, and other property that the town owns or uh, or leases. And uh, similarly, uh, the police what they would have as a remedy is the ability to issue a citation. But again, to temporarily impound or hold the vehicle until they can turn it over to a responsible, responsible adult. Again, this is focused on uh, these vehicles that are not street legal or are licensed for street use. Uh, that's just a very quick overview. And then through you, Madam Chair, I'd like to, to turn to Chief Reddick for any comments he might have. And then we're available for questions. And, and our recommendation is once once you're comfortable with this, um, if you would bring it bring it to the full council, and and obviously that that's your policy decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Uh, Chief Riddick. Uh, Chief Riddick, Police Chief Vern Riddick. Uh, the town manager did a really good job summarizing. Uh, I don't really have too much to add. The only thing I, I will, well, one of the things that I will add is. I'm grateful uh, uh, for him, um, Corporation Council, uh, and the mayor for their assistance with this, uh, to provide us with an extra tool when we have to deal with these situations for public safety. Uh, number two, uh, although it's 72 hours, if no one claims the ATV after that, we have the ability to seize it and then put it out to auction. So uh, that's really important. I think because most of these are either stolen or unregistered and they're not street legal. So that is an important mechanism and a tool to have. So uh, that's about it. You know, thank you for this. And we look forward to uh, this passing in, in this sometime in the near future. Thank you, Chief Riddick. Uh, any questions for the chief or Mr. Hart or any comments? Uh, Councilor Williams and then Councilor Fay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> uh, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Hart, uh, Mr. Riddick, uh, Corporation Council for your work on this. I just have a, and I think this is great, uh, and I think it's it's a it's a really useful tool because it seems to me that it's a deterrent. So the only question I have, Chief, is it's sort of application is with with what we've been seeing going on with I don't know what the word is, but the the parades of the ATV is coming through when you have high volume is the idea that, you know, if we, if we pull over one or two, it creates a deterrent deterrent and, and perhaps then folks won't uh, behave in this fashion, in this town. I just want to get a sense of the, the bigger picture. 
Um, but I appreciate I'm very supportive and uh, I think it's a good idea. All right, thank you, uh, Councilor Williams. That's a different scenario. Uh, you know, I think not much will change as far as our enforcement with that. Uh, as usual, we will make an attempt to activate our lights and sirens to pull an ATV over, uh, but they take off, they take off. In a large group like that, we have to put the risk to the public, uh, has to override our zeal to get these offenders off the street. So what we have been doing, and we're not condoning it, but in an effort for safety, is at least blocking off some intersections, getting them through uh, as soon as possible. Now, where this is effective is our intel that will develop afterwards through uh, calls to our tip line, to our own intelligence, and when I get to my report later, uh, the regional task force that's now up and running, and we identify these folks, and then we're able to seize uh, these ATVs, that sends a strong message when you get your vehicle taken and then it's sold. Um, I believe that's a huge deterrent and will help keep our streets safe. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Councilor Faye? Uh, yes, Ms. Blanks, thank you very much through you. Um, I definitely think this is a great first step to to try to combat the proliferation of these vehicles flying through our town. And I, I think it's been noted before, as we've spoken about this, that we're not the only town that's it's in a lot of um, greater Hartford, especially the abutting towns. Mm. Thank you. And I, and I think this is uh, something that I will absolutely wholeheartedly support. My question is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I've read about this, and the changes in our legislation regarding police the accountability act specifically I, I think the hardest part probably and you could tell me more than i can uh surmise here but it's how do you catch them uh, so we can't pursue you can't do the i forget what the tool is called called but the things with the spikes so you can't try to slow them down so i think it's very noble to say that we can seize their property if it's not claimed and things like that as a deterrent but how, I, my, my question comes down to how do you catch them in the first place? I think that's uh, quite a big hurdle. So thank you very much. Uh, Chief Riddick, uh, through you, Madam Chair, I apologize for not being clear earlier. Uh, part of our way for enforcing this is, again, through intelligence, uh, whether it's through uh, the tip line and tips that come in from the community or the regional task force developing intelligence. So once you find out where they're storing your ATVs, then we can do surveillance and catch them before they, they take off. We catch them stagnant. Um, that was mentioned by the town manager earlier. Uh, we do social media rakes so we can find out the social media where their meeting places are. And with the assistance of the regional task force, ourselves and CSP, uh, we can converge and block in at a parking lot or something and then just start picking off people one by one. So I apologize for not getting a deeper dive into that explanation. Uh, but that is uh, mechanisms we can utilize to combat this issue. That's extremely helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Councillor Faye. Any other uh, comments or questions? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Blanks. So uh, I, I think that this is a, a a much needed uh, response uh, to something that's happening in the community. It's it's unfortunate that uh, almost in all of our neighboring communities, people are seeing this on, on the weekends. Um, the motoring public is, is uh, confused. Don't, they don't want to get uh, injured themselves, nor do they wish to injure uh, these people who are behaving like this. And uh, uh, so far, we've been sort of fortunate that uh, there really hasn't been a loss of life uh, to an innocent victim of, of these shenanigans, that's what I would call it, uh, as they uh, pop wheelies and run through traffic lights. And I, I've seen this on the Berlin Turnpike, and uh, it's just it just amazes me that this go forward. So I'm really interested in next steps. Uh, I, I think it, this, is, this is a good, good piece of legislation. I appreciate the efforts of Corporation Council and uh, Attorney of the Tour. Uh, for working with Chief Riddick and the manager and the mayor to uh, to get us here. So, uh, do we anticipate that this would be 
uh, placed on a, a very um, upcoming agenda of the town council. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Davidoff and Mr. Hart. And thank you, Madam Chair, Matt Hart, Town Manager. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, for the question. Uh, our our recommendation, you know, once once the committee is comfortable with it, you know, just to move it forward to the council. And if you're comfortable with it tonight, you know, we could certainly get it on the agenda for the second meeting in uh, in October. If you want another meeting or so with it, you know, we understand that too. Thank you, Mr. Hart and uh, Mayor Cantor. Thank you, and th thank you, Attorney Latour, for your work on this. I, um, I, I, and I, obviously, the the leadership um, uh, for the chief, you know, to to work with, uh, within um, what we have to make sure that uh, that we they that the police have the tools that they need. So um, this would be subject to a public hearing. So we would put it on just to clarify. We would put it on the agenda. The second meeting, then it would be set for public hearing. This would be a potentially new council. So I'm wondering uh, logistically if it makes sense to. I, I don't want to delay it, but I'm wondering if it it makes sense to. I just don't, you know, I'm coming out of the public safety committee. Put some of the members are going to change. So I don't know if uh, we want to. There's any input on that. But I, I'm happy to move it. I'm obviously I'm not a committee member, but and I and I support it. So I I want to hear what you guys uh, think. But um, on timing, so thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, thank you, Mayor Deputy Mayor Late Davidoff. Respond. Uh, I, I I understand that we're in between election cycles. I, I think it probably, Madam Mayor, to, uh, through you. Uh, Chairman to, to the mayor, I think it would be uh, prudent for us to put it on the agenda to schedule it for a public hearing so that it would be one of the first items for the next council to address. And I think uh, uh, people could get up to speed quite rapidly uh, on this particular issue. I don't really think it's going to need a, a lot of uh, background information or tutoring uh, to get uh, new members up to speed on this. And uh, the other thing is, as we approach the uh, winter months, uh, and uh, if snow starts to fall, there may be a, a greater likelihood that they would not engage in this activity uh, for fear of maybe they're going to uh, wreck their vehicles that they probably don't own. So. Mayor Cantor. Not through me, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, I do agree. I just want to make sure that if the committee, uh, that makes it more important, I think, that the committee make the recommendation for this is my kind of my point. So we move forward and then get it on the agenda for the second October meeting, and then um, we'll be set for public hearing with it maybe the, the December December meeting probably. But first, yeah. Thank you, Mayor and Councilor Williams. I see your. Wait, hand. I just want to finish. Attorney Latour, could you just check the timing of that because I think this is different in that we have thirty days and we have an odd schedule for November. So I just want to make sure that that will work for our. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilor Williams, did you want to comment? While it looks like Attorney Latour is looking at the calendar. Sure. Thank you, Chairwoman. I, I think um, Deputy Mayor Davidoff's point uh, in the mayor's is a good one. I think uh, as someone who's not going to be a, in the next council, I think it makes sense to move this forward because it is something that I think is going to have pretty strong support. And to Mr. Davidoff's um, point, it would be unfortunate if, as we get in the winter months, this issue kind of falls off the radar. It would be nice to just get it acted on. So. When the weather gets better, our officers have the tools that they need to deal with this issue. That's just my thought. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Williams. And I concur. I agree. Um, what I did want to say is I know when this activity occurred in our center, I was away um, and out of town. And when I heard about it, I mean, I was just floored that something like this would occur. And it's probably 
cliche because most people say, oh, not in my backyard or not in my town, but I think we have to all come to the realization that it can happen uh, anywhere. And it seems like it's happening everywhere. And in order for us to address this and um, stop it is we have to act now and have to act quickly. And I also would like to commend um, Chief and uh, Mr. Hart and uh, Corporation Counsel and Attorney Latour for putting this together so quickly. Um, I know there's many concerns around town in terms of uh, why don't we do? And um, this is what I love about our team because we do. We do the, the heavy lifting um, and we don't just talk about it. We actually put the feet to the fire and we do something about it. Everybody gets engaged and they draft the material that needs to be uh, drafted and we collaborate and we come out and we, um, we, we provide action and we get it done. And so here it is, we have something in front of us and I do st strongly feel that we do need to move this forward and um, act on it quickly. Okay, so if there isn't any other discussion or questions on this, we can move to the next agenda item. All right. Panhandling. Update on panhandling initiative. So Mr. Hart, I'll, I'll toss it over to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Matt Hart again, town manager. Just to clarify if I could on, on the last item. So at the direction from the committee is We'll put it on the next council agenda unless we're going to run into any complications with a public hearing as as the mayor identified and, and if we do then we can just introduce it in in november but uh, we'll hope that we don't have any of those conflicts and we'll put it on the the agenda for your last meeting in october you can receive it and schedule the public hearing yes great thank you uh, so we wanted to provide the committee with an update on our panhandling initiative this evening. I think it's going to be a little bit of a, a team effort here. Um, there are a couple of us who would like to uh, to speak, but I, I believe a combination of, of Ms. Robino Turco and uh, Ms. Calderon wanted to add a few more introductory comments regarding Samantha and, and why we chose her and, and the work she's been doing. And then I believe we're going to turn to Lieutenant Vafiatis to talk about the uh, the good work of our PD on this initiative over the last several weeks. So through you, Madam Chair, I guess I would turn next to uh, Ms. Rubino Turco. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hart. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Turco, it's over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Blanks, and thank you, um, Town Manager Matt Hart. Um, I wanted to um, reintroduce or um, Samantha Innes to you. Um, she introduced herself at the very beginning of our of our meeting. Um, Samantha is a, a social worker that has joined our our team under the um, supervision of Astrid Calderon, the manager, um, and her task really is um, is to do case management, particularly in the area of mental health and substance abuse, as well as crisis management, and also outreach to the community. So she's not just a social worker, she's also the liaison to our police department. Um, she and Astrid and some other members of our team took a tour there this morning and uh, were really welcomed by our colleagues in the, in the police department. We're very grateful for this collaboration. So really her background um, is really well suited for this level of work um, and uh, we're, we're very uh, happy to have her. Um, certainly outreach in the community, um, you know, is very important, um, but also the follow up um, and the case management of that um, will also be um, an area of uh, that Samantha will be spending time with. Um, in the area of panhandling specifically, we did host a panhandling roundtable this past summer in July. It was really a regional discussion of more than 20 people of, from a variety of backgrounds, 
um, and sectors that deal with um, panhandling and uh, the as associated reasons behind panhandling. And we had people from um, neighboring towns and we really all came to the same conclusion that a regional approach is best. And although we discussed um, several action items that I believe uh, Lieutenant Vafiatis will go into, we also, um, we also made a pledge through the uh, Capital Region Council of Governments to continue this regional discussion. And they will be hosting um, the next meeting of this panhandling uh, work group, if you will, um, in November. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Turco. Um, any questions or comments for Mrs. Turco? This is Rubino Turco. Mayor Cantor. I just want to formally welcome Samantha and thank you so much for welcome to the team. Thank you so much in advance for I'm sure you've already done good work, but for all you're going to do for our community. Um, really welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, anybody else? Any other questions or comments? Just a comment, uh, Chief Riddick, uh, had the opportunity to pleasure uh, Assistant Chief Tara and myself to sit on Samantha's oral board uh, and ask her some, some pretty tough questions. Uh, she didn't flinch, uh, she handled well under pressure and uh, we, we have a we believe we have a very good selection of a consummate, a consummate professional and we're very pleased to have her to be part of our team so, so thank you thank you chief riddick and again welcome happy to see your face on the screen all right uh let's see communications and Fire department, so is that you, Chief Priest? You're going to lead us off with a report. Oh, Mr. Hart. Oh, Madam Chair, Matt Hart, uh, again. Uh, before we, we go there, if we could ask Lieutenant Vafiatis to provide us with a report on, on uh, the police department's work in collaboration with social services on the panhandling initiative. Sorry, I probably didn't make that clear at the beginning. Okay, not a problem, Mr. Hart. You're human. Okay, Lieutenant, <laughs> take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, as, as you all know, we've we've recapped some uh, some action items that, that we as a as a group had discussed with the public education campaign, um, the possibility of an ordinance, the possibility of some signage. From the police department's perspective, one one um, action item that we implemented immediately was making a special classification for panhandling calls. So before, as we've discussed, these calls were kind of uh, classified under a bunch of different types of calls for service. So it was hard for us to, to really capture which um, calls for service were directly related to panhandling. So we uh, created a classification um, for data tracking on panhandling complaints. So that's helped us tremendously. And um, so what uh, we as a team do on the police department side is is go we go through and evaluate that data and I look into every call for service to see um, the person that it is the locations and just see uh, I keep in the back of my mind if if we were to have any of these action items in place would it impact the actual calls for service that are coming in whether it's welfare checks or aggressive panhandling and things of that nature so. That, that's helped us a lot in, in, first of all, measuring the call volume related to panhandling, but also it's helped us to compare against some of the proposed action items. And um, as uh, Mr. Vino Turco said, we have a, a meeting coming up on November 9th. Um, in addition to to um, adding the social worker, I think I think we're heading in the right direction for the regional approach, but. Specific to West Hartford, we are evaluating the data constantly as far as um, panhandling related calls for service. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. 
Uh, any questions for the lieutenant or this is Regino Turco? Mayor, did you have? Um, if not, I do have, um, I guess I have a question. It could even be a comment. Uh, in terms of the data tracking of the ban panhandling complaints, do you receive more complaints on, um, I guess, on a particular panhandler uh, more so than others? And I'm thinking of a few areas in town where, uh, and I know, Chief, you had um, talked about this some time ago about the aggressor or stepping into the lane and that type of thing. And it seems like a few of them, maybe all of them, have that piece down pat. But I'm thinking of two in particular that seems to have that um, under control. So I would say they probably are micro <laughs> aggressor or, or aggressive. But um, so a lot of times when I'm in the morning going to work, it's almost like they're standing uh, in the sidewalk, but they'll kind of step in the road, but then they'll step back and then they'll have their little sign. It's almost like they're pushing the sign into the windshield, not really, but you know, like I'm gonna really strongly urge you to give me something. And I know some people do stop at the light and they give, you know, they give it to them. And I know you're probably getting some complaints. So I'm just curious, are there particular areas in town where you get more complaints about a particular panhandler than others? That's my question. There, there are a few intersections and, and a few panhandlers where I would say um, we, we do get more calls on than other just because they're in, in more highly visible areas. Um, the one difficulty that we do have in going through each and every one of these cases, you know, looking at the, at the CAD comments, which is exactly what the caller is stating, is people either want to remain anonymous, they don't want to make an, a formal complaint. It's more like, you know, oh, for your information, this person's out there. By the time a Mark Cruiser comes up, they they know the rules, they know they know what's going on. So it, it's it's very difficult for us from a per, uh, patrol perspective to to um, you know to enforce some of that stuff. But also, I think that's where the public education piece comes in. Uh, as as far as you know, it, it's difficult for us to enforce some of this stuff if you're not willing to to make a, a complaint, or you know, you you say you don't want any any enforcement action taken, but you know, you're concerned for for their safety type of thing. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I know before, um, Mr. Hart, we talked about messaging. Um, whether we are using our website or what have you to put that type of information out there. And I know that, um, you know, you said that that's what we were doing, but I'm just wondering if there's some other ways that we can address that to perhaps minimize and eventually uh, have people stop, you know, giving things to the panhandlers because, you know, some of them, feel really bad for them. I have a few of those in my family who feel really bad for the panhandlers, even though I try to educate them and say, mm, not so much, you know, they're making out pretty well. So probably better than you, you should really keep your money in your pocket. But I'm just wondering if there's anything else that we could do <laughs> education wise. Matt Hart, town manager, I'll, I'm happy to lead off and then ask my colleagues if there's anything they would they would like to add. So thank you for the good question, Madam Chair. I think it's going to be an ongoing education effort. And, uh, you know, the folks we have working on this most directly, Lieutenant Bafiatis and Ms. Innes will probably have some good ideas around this too. But, you know, periodically, I think we have to engage in that effort to try to educate the uh, the community. You know, we have talked a little bit before about posting physical signage around town, like some other communities around the country have done. I think we're a little bit concerned about that. You know, that's some of the feedback we received at the uh, the regional forum that we conducted. 
Uh, on that front, I think working in collaboration with uh, our neighboring municipalities through the council governments, which was really you know excited to help sponsor this. And if as a region, as a region, we can conduct an educational campaign for the region's residents, you know, working in concert across multiple towns. And I think those are some of the ideas that that we're exploring. Um, I'll pause there, see if Ms. Rubino Turco has uh, anything additional she'd like to add or or Ms. Ennis or, or the chief. Thank you, Mr. Hart. So through you, Madam Chair, Chief Riddick. Now, I'll try to use my words very, very carefully. Um, it is an issue. Most of the pan, majority of the, the panhandlers are not violating the law. Um, I think the one or two that you might see who step into the road for a half a second or two, and that we'd be hard pressed to make an arrest on that. We would give a warning, but as was mentioned earlier, they're very astute, they're, they're very educated, and they know what they're doing. And what I'm concerned for our officers is to be baited into a situation where someone's standing by with a, a video camera and these people are lawfully exercising their constitutional rights. And then we get into a situation because there is a small outcry regarding this behavior in our town. Secondly, and this is very important. These panhandlers are making money. So that means there's a number of people who are providing the funding. So if you make that connection to say that maybe these people aren't bothered by the behavior. So there's another group of folks who are not bothered by this behavior. Uh, these folks are out there, so they're making money. If it wasn't profitable for them, they would not be standing there. So we have to work that very delicate balance. And as a point of just a re-education again, uh, we've identified all the panhandlers uh, we've done some research on them. Uh, there's a, only a, a few that really need some mental health issues uh, and, and, and other things, but most of them are in their right mind and just using this as a way to make income. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, and, and I get it for the aggressive plan handling. But when we did have that occur, we did take action. I, I don't know why I keep forgetting the gentleman's name, Mr. Green. Uh, and we took care of him. We did warrants. We arrested him and, and got him out. Uh, but most of these folks are exercising their constitutional rights that are protected. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, I would just say, I know I've been educated just being on this committee and I've educated others, you know, and, and through that, some of them have, you know, held back, uh, given money to the panhandlers, but there's still, you know, more work to be done. And, um, I'm hopeful that we can get some type of education campaign going so that we can minimize it and eventually, you know, eradicate uh, this type of behavior. Okay. Any more comments or questions on this? Okay, now I can turn it over to you, Mr. Hart and uh, Chief Priest for communications and starting off with the fire department. I know Chief Priest and Chief Riddick, they always have this running competition in terms of who wishes to go first. So I'll let you handle that, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. Matt Hart, Town Manager. We'll turn to a, next to our all star fire department team. We've got Chief Priest, Assistant Chief O'Callaghan, and Assistant Chief Sensigali on the line as well. Gentlemen, take it away. Not much of a competition, but we, we do play well. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, do, we do appreciate this committee. Um, I have submitted a written staff report. We wanted to touch on two issues. I will let uh, Assistant Chief Sintagalli uh, make a small comment on uh, 2C of my report, which is regarding his website resources and a small uh, notification about a grant. Um, and then I will turn to Assistant Chief O'Callaghan just to talk briefly about some upcoming community events before turning it over to uh, the police department. So, Mike, it's all yours, then uh, Chief O'Callaghan. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, through you. Uh, we're pleased to announce that we were awarded a, uh, a modest grant from the uh, Connecticut Fair Plan of $475 for the purchase of uh, hand tools that we use in fire 
uh, during fire investigations. We'll be providing um, the three complete sets of hand tools for uh, the three investigators, uh, the, the three uh, uh, certified staff people in the office to be performing um, fire scene examinations. Um, uh, Inspector uh, Marsha Dell has been uh, has been pretty diligent in finding us these little grants and um, and getting them for us. This is the second grant that that we received. The first grant was for um, lighting equipment that we are providing our vehicles with for lighting the fire scenes during the investigation. Um, the the other the other thing that Chief Priest um, asked that I comment on is the. Um, our web page uh, for the fire marshal's office. We've been uh, building it over the past um, over the past year. Uh, we're particularly um, pleased and and proud of the website that we have for um, as providing a resource for teachers in the school system. Our efforts in public education have been hampered in the schools due to COVID. So we've turned to more. Uh, so we've turned to um, uh, computer based programs that we provide and resources that we provide to the in, to the teachers through our website. Um, and it's available for anybody uh, that can go uh, for anybody to go and see. I've provided you uh, on my report uh, with two links, one for the um, one for the teachers website and the uh, uh, and uh, the other one uh, just to our uh, our general website. Um, We've been building um, information on there for uh, emergency contact information form for business owners and building owners to report into us uh, owner information uh, that's used during emergencies. Uh, that's um, and that um, that form automatically goes over to the police department and to the uh, dispatchers and to the building department. Um, we also have uh, well property checklists and everything. So our resources. For our business community and to get information back into uh, emergency services uh, is is all going through our website uh, website now, and uh, but please take a look at our website if you have a chance. Thank you. Thanks, Mike Chief. Okay, uh, Madam Chair, through you, Hugh O'Callaghan, Assistant Chief West Hartford Fire. So I just wanted to update everybody on a, a small project we're working on, uh, our health and recovery, our safety officer. Uh, William Shepard is working on a plan to uh, bring a safety day down to the Elmwood Community Center. Uh, it, nothing is uh, permanent yet, or, or we're just framing it out right now. We're in the early stages, but essentially we're looking at around November 13th to bring together uh, the police department, the health district, and the fire department to offer a um, a fire extinguisher give back. And in return, we will give a fire extinguisher up to about a hundred. We were able to secure some funding through Home Depot, one of our partners. So uh, we will be able to go through with that with about 100 extinguishers. Uh, through the PD, we're going to see if we can do some kind of drug uh, take back so that we can get the get um, prescription drugs where they need to go instead of just sitting in cabinets where there's potential for children getting a hold of them and, and those sorts of things. And through the health district, we're going to see if we can run a table for uh, flu shots or uh, COVID shots. Uh, we're going to work with uh, Amy Krause to see if we can do something uh, like that. Um, and we're also going to have a station set up for the uh, special needs registry. Make sure that everybody who wants to be on that can get on that. Um, and, and we will help walk people through that. We're also going to have some handouts for children. We're going to be able to give away some smoke alarms, some CO detectors, and some first aid kits. Essentially, this is going to be four hours of conversation with public safety. and um, some and people will be able to walk away with some good information and hopefully some tools that they can put inside their house to keep them safe. Um, I also want to talk uh, really quickly about some of the outreach we've been doing uh, through the senior center. We've been able to get some uh, questions and answers going with small groups now that COVID is starting to um, lighten up a little bit. So our firefighters have been able to go out and, and get get involved with the uh, senior centers. Uh, and William Shepard has identified some barriers that people were not able to get the information they needed. So he has done his uh, due diligence and looked at ways that we can get the word out to everybody uh, for public safety. Uh, so we're going to be using WebEx meetings. We're going to be using uh, recordings and submitting them on YouTube. And we're going to be uh, 
getting out and putting some boots on the ground to make sure we're getting to where we need to be so that everybody has all the information they uh, they need. Uh, that's that's pretty much it, but the uh, Elmwood Community Center is probably going to be a, a four hours of a good day of just uh, some interaction with all the agencies in town. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm just going to speak very quickly before turning over to uh, Chief Riddick. Uh, recently, um, uh, we collaborated with the police department with risk management from the town um, and members of the police department to uh, do a lockdown drill that was conducted uh, the other day. Uh, we received uh, numerous um, positive feedback from the employees that are working there, and we're making some updates on that. And uh, as I turn it over to uh, Chief Reddick for his report, I would certainly uh, like to recognize um, uh, Lieutenant Bafiatis and uh, Sergeant Michael for their uh, assistance planning and execution of that drill. I do think we are uh, moving forward in an excellent direction towards uh, planning and preparedness. So, um, with that, uh, I believe I will go back to Tom Manager Hart to introduce the uh, second best public safety department. <laughs> Chief, it's all you. Good before, to see you, sir. Before we do that, Deputy Mayor Davidoff has a question. So, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Blanks. Uh, to you, Chief Priest, uh, I read the uh, report that you submitted. So, thank you for getting to us well before the meeting. And on the, I think it's the, the first page of your report. Uh, to the town manager under item 4 E 4 C, uh, there was mention of transitioning to a new revenue recovery uh, vendor for EMS. And if you could uh, elaborate on that, that would be helpful since uh, not only do I wear a hat as a member of this committee, but I also chair the finance committee. So I'd be very interested in hearing uh, what's happening there. Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you for the question, Deputy Mayor. With regards to that particular uh, item in my written report, um, when the town went to paramedic service in 2016, we solicited and publicly bid for a revenue recovery vendor. Um, that vendor then um, was bought by another company. We've been working with them fairly successfully. Um, however, at about five years into our paramedic program, we felt that our due diligence was to go out to bid to make sure that we were getting the most competitive rate, ensure that we were getting the service. I would note that um, while we didn't have any problems with our current vendor, um, I think it's good fiscally responsible to make sure that we're getting the best service. Um, we uh, went through a bid process. Uh, one particular vendor came in at a lower rate. Uh, they are local to the state of Connecticut. That was also um, part of uh, our selection process, uh, which consisted also of uh, Lisa Newton from finance and procurement. Um, and that vendor is giving us um, a 1% difference in our, uh, our revenue recovery rate. So the town's cost to recover uh, money for the paramedic service will be less. Um, as we move closer to the transition to that vendor, um, I expect to come forward with the committee with more information. Also, um, some outreach as well to our seniors um, about uh, what billing is all about, making sure that our website is very robust with that. So um, I, I look forward to giving you more specifics about that um, as, a, as a full agenda item as we move forward in the future. But we're, we're pleased with uh, what we resulted, uh, what the public bid resulted in. Thank you, Chief and uh, Deputy Mayor. Were you all set? Did you have a follow up? No, no, I appreciate the answer and uh, look forward to hearing more details in the future. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair, Matt Hart, Town Manager. Before we turn things over to the PD and to Chief Riddick, I just wanted to ask uh, Chief Priest and Assistant Chief O'Callaghan if they could elaborate a little bit more on a proposed fire extinguisher exchange program that uh, actually Councillor Gold brought the idea to us, something we're excited about and, and working on. Sure, thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry uh, that we weren't more clear on that. Um, so Councillor Gold had approached us about uh, the concept of a, an extinguisher take back day uh, that was going to be, you know, potentially at a regional level through the MDC's hazardous waste. Um, we evaluated that proposal. We looked at some of the other issues going on in the fire department um, with the impending time change. Um, so knowing that uh, changing the batteries and the smoke detectors is important. Um, but obviously, as you've, as you've seen, um, you know, the, the, the good back and forth between the police and fire department, 
Uh, we believe that public safety um, in a col is, is very collaborative, and this is why we came up with uh, the idea of Safety Day. So it was initiated in part with um, Councillor Gold, and then it's been uh, it's been rounded out um, with with some other ideas. So that is uh, the response. So, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hart um, and Chief Priest. Any other questions before we move to Chief Riddick? Okay, before we do, I do have a quick question for you, Chief Priest, just looking at the report on item 4D, working with risk on replacing the AEDs within town buildings. I'm just curious in terms of uh, who in terms of town staff is trained to use those and how often is the training provided? So the the AEDs were installed in the building. Um, I don't believe, um, or I, I would say that I'm personally unaware of whether or not there was a focused training initiative towards that. But this is a this is the first step towards that, which is ensuring that the equipment is there, that we're able to monitor remotely, and then we can deploy training. And um, I know that Lisa Mashad has had a lot of uh, contact in this area. She's done a great job of making sure that there are emergency plans in place. But it is our intention to bring additional training out as these AED or AEDs are rolled out um, with the eventual intent of uh, restoring our heart safe community designation, which is provided by the Department of Public Health. Okay, thank you, Chief Grace. Okay, no uh, other- Ms. Excuse me, Ms. Aunt Carol, if, yep. if I may. I apologize for the uh, lack of video. I just had my hand up. Um, I, I just wanna acknowledge and uh, appreciate uh, the work that uh, Chief Priest uh, put into putting this uh, public safety day together in Elmwood. I think it's important. I think it's uh, certainly uh, informational and uh, educational. And I think that's the key to, to what we need to provide to our community is education. Uh, and the fire extinguisher swap was the, the kind of the, the, the first step towards that um, in bringing all prongs of our public safety departments together and educating our public. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Gold, and thank you for coming back because I noticed that your um, your box wasn't there. So thank you for you know letting me know. Okay, are we ready for Chief Riddick? Okay, take it away, Chief Riddick. Brian Riddick, Police Chief. Uh, again, good evening, everyone. Uh, kudos to the Fire Department and this initiative, and including us. Thank you for that. Uh, Chief Priest and I have been discussing a collaboration such as this for uh, many a moon, and I'm glad that uh, we're able to work together and, and pull this off uh, to incorporate the fire extinguisher exchange and a drug take back uh, together. But that shows the relationship that we have, and it also shows the commitment we have collectively for the community. Uh, number two, um, Officer Sanford, if you can raise your hands so people know who you are, Nick. Thank you. And Officer Hopkins, we can do the same. Uh, Nick's at Hall High and Joe is at Connor. And the reason why I had them stay on, uh, normally uh, they'd be off by now. And of course, we got Pistol Pete in the back, who we had to put, put back to patrol temporarily. Um, he was going through the grammar schools. But there are your two SROs and the high schools. And there's been conversations about you know, pulling SROs uh, out of the schools pulling police officers out of the schools. I'm glad that we work in a community that does not advocate that. And I think that you saw, excuse me, I know that you saw from that presentation and that idea, uh, the genesis of which came from them. Uh, they were in the environment, they came up with the idea collectively and put forth that awesome presentation uh, to change the lives of our youth. That's why they're there. Uh, they're not there to lock up people. They're not there to cause troubles and to be divisive. They are there to be a resource. They are there to be mentors. They are there to be advocates. They are there to gather intel to prevent crimes from recurring. And what you saw today was a demonstration of that. So I commend them. I applaud them, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart uh, for their commitment. And as I close on this, and I want to bring everyone back full circle, you've heard yours truly and other chiefs talk about 
uh, the the crime that's occurring and the violence that's occurring. And one thing we all we talked about with social services is we were not going to arrest our way out of this. We are the end user. Uh, we we've talked about getting into the families, getting into the children, early on, and this is a prime example of putting our money, our action, and our resources where our mouth is. So thank you, gentlemen, for hanging on. I hope it was well worth it. And uh, feel free to jump off. But now if you're here so long, you might as well hang out. So, <laughs> so thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And to the fire department, thank you for the continued collaboration. Um, again, I want to remind everyone that's on the call, our tip line, 860-570-8969. And uh, via email, whptips at westhartfordct.gov for the community. And I'll briefly go through some really excellent work that's been done by our personnel, our detective bureau, our patrol division, our uh, community support unit, just a lot of good work. Uh, there's some other things that we've done behind the scenes that I'm not at liberty to talk about yet. I look forward to that opportunity so you can really see the great work that our police department is doing, keeping everyone safe, including the firefighters. That being said, um, we made an arrest with the uh, Hillcrest shooter and the Hillcrest app, and we have another warrant coming for that uh, for an assault. Excellent police work, excellent detective work, uh, boots on the ground, bring that to fruition. As we recall, also it was in the newspaper, we arrested both subjects for the Santander and the Best Buy perch snatching. We had elderly folks that were robbed of their property, dragged to the ground. And our police officers, you know, starting from scratch, doing some great investigative work, collaborating with other agencies, were able to secure arrest warrants and bring those perpetrators to fruition. For recall, we had a uh, carjacking back in June of this year. Now, this is separate from the one that we had at the post office. And we made an arrest of one of those carjacking suspects. Uh, we are in the process of securing a, an arrest warrant for his partner. Uh, that individual is currently incarcerated, so we're working and putting things together, building probable cause to bring that arrest. We also working on another uh, car theft that occurred at Albany and North Maine, and there's a suspect. And as I was sitting here, we're getting texts and updates uh, from Captain Clark, who's in charge of our detective bureau, uh, that uh, one of our suspects, who we believe the perpetrator is, was actually captured on something else in Florida. So that's hot off the press. Uh, we're still working that, uh, but again, that intelligence to have to get that information and it shows the connections that we do have in the public safety community. Uh, again, just shows our efforts and our dedication and our due diligence. Um, again, under the tutelage of Captain Clark, uh, he reached out and we're in the process of getting four detectives status, uh, certified in rapid DNA analysis. If we recall, this rapid DNA was referenced when the Farmington. Uh, incident that occurred, an officer was crushed in a vehicle, and through rapid DNA, they're able to get it into the CODIS system and identify an individual quickly. So now we're going to have four detectives, and our plan is to get our entire detective bureau certified so that they can be um, get the, the, the information, uh, get the evidence, put in the CODIS, make some matches, and get that turnaround uh, sometimes within two to four hours as opposed to waiting days. And the overall system. So, you know, big thanks to Captain Clark for that and his team. And then lastly, uh, well, second to lastly, uh, Detective Del Monte uh, was very instrumental with bringing and identifying the perpetrator with the Farmington uh, situation with the officer, uh, O'Donnell. Uh, he was working with the CSP. Uh, CSP processed the scene. Uh, they were able to lift the print, and Del Monte is a certified print examiner and expert. He was able to look at that and match that up with the individual. So, again, I just have to applaud our people for what they did. Uh, awesome old fashioned police work coupled with modern technology uh, working again to provide a safe environment for all of our personnel and our public. Our community support unit, uh, better known as CSU, uh, in the past month have executed one search warrant. Seized thirty four hundred dollars in cash, uh, cocaine, cocaine nineteen grams, uh, fentanyl eight hundred and thirty three grams, uh, four 
misdemeanor arrest, excuse me, three misdemeanor arrests, one felony arrest, and they secured one firearm. So a lot of good work being done for a lot of people, which has resulted in our up-to-date crime data through September uh, for our part one crime. Again, just as a reminder what part one consists of, murder, sexual assault, robbery, burglary, uh, theft from buildings, negligent homicide, auto theft. Uh, we are currently down 17% um, year to date compared to last year. Uh, well done. Now, the, there is an uptick that we do have in our robberies. We are uh, right now compared to last year, 100% higher than we were than last year. And that fits the narrative as we've seen statewide with some increase in violence. Uh, but overall, uh, we're trending down. We will continue to work di diligently. We'll continue to partner with the FD, the health department, social services, town hall, whoever we need to, uh, to provide a better environment for all of us. So I thank you for your time again to the SROs and, and Pete. Thank you, Lieutenant Bafiatis. Uh, thank you, Captain Clark, Detective Real, Sergeant Michael. Uh, thank you. And I really appreciate working with all of you. Great teamwork. Thank you, Chief. And I echo what your Chief said, because you all have done an awesome job. This has been a great meeting um, with all the wealth of information that has come forward. So I just want to, again, thank you for all that you do. And I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Mayor David Off. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Banks. Uh, Chief, I think yesterday I was able to catch the news conference in front of the Superior Court in Hartford. And I appreciate you and other members of our department showing solidarity. Uh, to be there for the arraignment of uh, that individual uh, who has uh, been arrested for causing uh, the crushing uh, of Officer O'Donnell in the Farmington Police Department. It, it uh, the visual just spoke volumes that uh, not only uh, did this incident occur in Farmington, but it was um, something that affected the entire region, and it just. Uh, was explained uh, by um, the chief there of the Farmington Police Department, a former West Hartford uh, member, that um, all the different resources from all the different uh, departments that uh, cooperated, cooperated uh, to bring this individual to justice. And uh, as you pointed out, the expertise of our individuals able to identify uh, the latent prints uh, with our lab right here at uh, West Hartford PD was uh, essential in, in making this connection. So uh, thank you for uh, taking uh, that time, demonstrating leadership uh, and, and representing our, our residents and our department uh, to in, in solidarity uh, for this uh, very tragic uh, incident to happen uh, to this individual who is just basically doing their job. And uh, if I can, uh, Madam Chair, if you indulge me one minute, I believe that tonight is the uh, last uh, public safety meeting of this term, and I'd like to uh, recognize uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Williams, uh, for his service on this committee. While Chris and I uh, definitely have not agreed over the years uh, with respect to many of the topics uh, discussed around this table, uh, Chris was always an active volunteer, uh, an active participant, well prepared. Um, participant and uh, did his homework. And while we philosophically disagreed on many of the things that were part of the paramedic program, uh, it was disagreeable, but not in um, in, in a bad way. And uh, I earned, a, I have a utmost respect for uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, he's a stand up guy who uh, took the time to make certain that he was present at each and every one of our meetings. Uh, in the last year, they've been most notably in the evening on Zoom, but there were many meetings uh, prior to this that were early in the morning, which meant uh, uh, Mr. Williams had small children where he needed to get them uh, dressed up and to some place prior to getting to town hall for an eight o'clock meeting. And uh, having been there many, many years ago, I, I recognize uh, that challenge unto itself. So, uh, Chris, uh, thank you for your many years of service uh, uh, to the uh, committee, your dedication, uh, and I just wish you uh, the best uh, going forward. It's been my honor and privilege uh, to serve with uh, someone of uh, your stature. So, thank you very much.
If I can, Madam Chair, through you, Chief Riddick. Chief, go ahead. Um, I guess I had my head in the sand. Um, Council Williams uh, has been professional in my interaction since I've been here. Um, as the deputy mayor said, stand up, honorable, uh, always kept his word, uh, always willing to to speak and work for the people. I, I have to admit, I'm very disappointed, and I'm sure I understand, probably understand why. But I don't have young ones anymore, so I'm well past that. <laughs> uh, and you do, so I, I understand family first. But I think it's, it truly is a loss. You always did your homework. Uh, I learned earlier on, uh, you and a couple others, that I have to be on my A game because I will get asked some tough questions, and I better have the data to back it up. Uh, so thank you for your service, your commitment. You actually did make a difference, and um, I personally am, am going to miss you, but thank you. Thank you, Chief. Riddick, uh, Mayor. Thank you. I, I also, Chris, I want to thank you so much for your commitment to public safety. You have been a, a solid contributor for a, a long time uh, on this committee uh, and bringing ideas, uh, questioning, in a really um, honest and and uh, prepared way, and I'm I really am so grateful for all of your incredible commitment and your contribution to this committee to the council as a whole. Um, but we're talking about this committee. The council piece will come later. Um, but I just am so grateful for all that you have brought to this committee. You've made us all more educated more engaged, I think, by challenging all of us uh, and um, and definitely made us all better. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, anybody else? Uh, Councillor Gold, I can't see if you have your hand up or Councillor Fay. If not, Chief Priest. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Blanks. I would be remiss also if I didn't echo the words of my colleague, um, Chief Riddick, about, um, you know, Councillor Williams. Uh, sir, you've been a pleasure to work with. Um, what of the things about being a staff member um, is, is to feel respected when you come before a committee, even when you may see things differently. I've always felt that way, and I've appreciated your input because it's caused us to look inside. And make sure that we're doing the right things for this community and without those different views that would not be possible. So thank you very much, sir. I do appreciate your service to this community and uh, I look forward to catching up with you um, when you're off the council and I look forward to whoever comes in behind you. Thank you, Chief Priest and Councilor Faye. Uh, Ms. Ms. Blanks, I'm uh, Okay, uh, Councilor Faye, I'm <laughs> gonna let Councilor Gold go or it doesn't matter who goes first. It's fine. Whatever you decide. Please, 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 please go, Ms. Faye. Oh, okay. Okay. Faye. Okay. okay. Chris, you're the best. Uh I'm gonna miss you terribly. I learned a lot from you for sure. And um, um there's so many more things that I could say, but you Definitely showed me the ropes when I first got involved and you've been very good friend and advisor and uh, I'll miss you terribly, but more to come on this, but I just did want to thank you for bringing me up to speed on this committee, which is so, so important to our town. So um, I'll talk to you more and congratulations. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you, Councillor Fay and Councillor Gold. Yes, thank, thank you, Ms. Blanks. Uh, I, I do want to thank Chris for all of his service. I think he is a uh, tremendous person, uh, honorable. Uh, he has been uh, a stalwart of our town, and the town is quite frankly lucky to have had him serve uh, in public service, which is uh, certainly an important part and aspect of uh, our community. Uh, having people like him uh, provide uh, and, and give their time, energy, effort, blood, sweat, and tears uh, to our town uh, makes our town better. And I truly applaud all of his efforts. I consider him a friend, value his opinion. Uh, he's always been consistent in his approach. And I look forward to many more conversations in the future. So thank you very much for all of your efforts, all of your uh, time. And certainly we'll speak more on that uh, at a later date as well. So thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Gold. Um, and so, Chris, for me, of course, I'm going to miss you. So I remember my first public safety meeting, and this is well before COVID, and you walked in, and I, you know, was happy, and then you started firing off those questions, and I was like, there it goes, Chris, but I love it. And I'm truly going to miss you. I remember the very first time I met you when I was running for board. And um, I've always had a lot of respect for you, all that you bring to the table. And you would uh, stir it up and you would just, you know, let us know that uh, it's not, it's not always um, as smooth that it's not always as easy and smooth as everybody would like to think. And you're gonna stir the pot and you're gonna bring up some of those things that people may feel is in, uncomfortable, but it's important because we're representing everybody. And you let us know that, you know, um, there's other people that needs to be represented and you, you um, give that voice. And um, I'm gonna miss you, but I'm gonna see you around town. So congratulations and, um, like Chief Riddick said, family comes first and you've got two small ones and these are the important times in their life. So again, thank you for your service. Go ahead, Chris, you can. Yeah, so uh, wow, uh, really unexpected. Yeah. Caught me off guard, so I appreciate all the kind words. It makes me really uncomfortable, but I, uh, but I appreciate it very much. I'm not deserving of it. I've been fortunate to be on the public safety committee now for six years, um, and uh, it's it's been a great experience. Um, you know, and over those six years, I've been able to see <clears throat> and hear the stories of the folks that really are the heroes in our fire department. And in our police department, who each and every day uh, risk their lives for uh, our community, and they don't always get the accolades that I just received, um, but they deserve it. Um, and it's it's really been a privilege. And I know, you know, it has hasn't always been a smooth relationship with me, and and particularly the fire department, if we're going to be honest. Um, but I've always respected them. Um, they do great work. Uh, Police department does great work and it's been an honor. And like I said, you know, volunteering in this community and this has been a, it's been an honor and a privilege and the folks who we hear about each and every time this committee meets, they're the heroes and they're the ones who deserve these, these types of accolades. Appreciate everyone's comments. Uh, Chief Priest, Chief Riddick, um, it's been an honor to serve with you both. You're very honorable men. Uh, the, the town is in incredibly good hands uh, in terms of your uh, work and policies with uh, public safety in conjunction with uh, Mr. Hart, who has made, I know, public safety a priority, as well as the mayor and deputy mayor. So, um, and, and really the council as a whole, I think, you know, public safety is always a priority. So thank you. The words are really appreciated. I think not necessarily deserved, but but uh, but thank you all. All right, um, Mr. Town Manager, I believe you're up, and that might be a really hard act to follow. But I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Matt Hart, Town Manager. Yes, it certainly will be. But uh, just a couple things I'd like to add. I'd like to thank all of our staff members for their good reports and uh, presentation today, you know, highlighted by the presentations made by our school resource officers. I went one thing, one theme I would like to highlight, and I know the mayor picked up on it, as did the chief, and I know it's important to the committee as a whole, is the collaboration and the interdepartmental approach, the interdisciplinary approach. You know, that's something we promote here, actively promote here in West Hartford at the leadership level. You know, departments getting out of their silos and uh, working together. Because when we work together, you know, we produce a better product and we do a better job. And I think we saw a few key examples of that tonight, police department working with, with uh, social services, 
and then the relationship that's developed, the excellent working relationship and friendly rivalry that's developed between the, uh, the FD and the PD. Um, as our veterans know, we didn't always have this, and it's important to promote and important to maintain uh, moving forward, and I, I greatly appreciate it. I'd also like to thank uh, Councillor Williams for, for his service. Um, you know, I've enjoyed serving along with you, Chris. I know, I know these remarks make you feel uncomfortable, but they are, they are deserved. And I appreciate your, your honor, your integrity, and uh, the perspective you bring to the table. And then last but certainly not least, I wanted to add that uh, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities has convened a special task force on violence prevention. It's being chaired by Mayor Rilling, the mayor of Norwalk, who is Norwalk's former chief of police. It's a really good group, a broad cross section of Connecticut municipalities. And uh, I'm, I'm representing the town of West Hartford. I'm sure the mayor will be involved as well, as will uh, Chief Riddick. We had a good first meeting that CCM convened a couple of weeks ago, and I'll keep the committee apprised of the work we're doing. We were able to share um, some of the comments and the good conversation we had with our own state delegation and the recommendations we specifically made with respect to, uh, to juvenile offenders. Uh, that completes my report, Madam Chair. Happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Uh, any questions for Mr. Hart? No, I don't see any. Uh, any questions, Mr. Gold, since I can't see you or your hand. Okay. All right, so if there are any other questions and Mayor, do you have a question or a comment? Okay. Uh, if there aren't any, then I would ask for a motion to adjourn. This was be before that, this was a great meeting, um, everybody. I mean, there was a wealth of information that was um, delivered and received and huge kudos to the school resource officers. They are definitely making some inroads and um, uh, the future, the future is bright. You know, I'm always so, um, thankful. Sometimes I have some uh, reservations, but when I see the young officers like we did tonight, it really does give me some hope that we've got some great leaders emerging and just a big, big congratulations and kudos to the leadership that's sitting around this table, especially to you, Chief Riddick and Chief Priest and your teams, because you're just, you're making huge inroads and huge differences here in our town. And that's why West Hartford continues to just lead in this state. So may I have a motion to adjourn? You can unmute. Anyone? Moved. Second. Good. Thank you, uh, everyone. Have a good night and um, be safe.